Welcome back to another episode of PCTV. I'm Nazar Rashid. And I'm Jared Kanak. Today we're going to show you a few different things about the differences between a laptop, an Ultrabook and a tablet or slate so that you can make an informed purchase decision if you're thinking of buying a new PC. We're also going to look at some fun things on the internet, some websites that we find useful and just interesting, and some of what we consider are indispensable applications that you can download for free and install yourself. Okay. Right now on PC TV, what we're going to do is we're going to go through the differences between some very portable computing hardware that we've been so graciously given by Leader Systems to play with. So we've got an Ultrabook here, we've got a slate or tablet there, and we've got your conventional laptop over there, and we're going to go through the differences between them. Well, uh, we can start off by looking at a slate. Everyone's familiar with these these days. Uh, extremely portable device with the obvious lack of a keyboard or mouse or anything because it all works via touchscreen. These are quite powerful these days. Uh, they can do most functions of, of a traditional computer. They can run all of your office applications. Very, very good for uh, Wi-Fi access in a McDonald's or very good for business meetings. So these are very rapidly getting into the market and uh, they're good. They're very light, very portable, but can be a little uh, cumbersome for some people to use when they're used to the keyboard and so forth. So with an Ultrabook, the physical difference is obviously is you begin with the fact that it's so much thinner than your normal laptop. It's This one in particular is only 18 millimeters thick and um, it's a very high-end spec one that Lita let us borrow and play with today. Um, it's got a few things that once again you have to ask yourself straight away, what is it that you're going to be using your computer for? Because in every case when you're about to purchase any kind of computer hardware, you want to know what it is that you want to use it for so you can tell whether or not it's going to have the specifications that make what you want to do possible. Now, there are always going to be trade-offs when it comes to a thinner Ultrabook. One of those trade-offs is, for example, straight away you can tell that there's no Blu-ray drive here, there's no DVD player or burner. So if you had your heart set on burning DVDs or watching Blu-rays or whatever, then you'd probably be looking at investing at least in getting an external optical drive in order to be able to do that because in order to keep it so thin, they don't have one on board. Now that's your biggest single difference between an Ultrabook and a normal laptop because a laptop has got everything and it's basically trying to be a replacement for your standard desktop and it can be. Whereas an Ultrabook is sort of much more portable, it's more about the convenience. I mean this one because of the fact that it's got such a high spec, you can do a lot more things than you would with a standard like run-of-the-mill one but however you won't be able to do stuff like watch through a Blu-ray or do some really advanced video editing and stuff like that. Conventional laptop these days is what people are familiar with but now they've kept them relatively the same size but they've packed in everything so they're about as powerful as your standard box on the desk. They can do really anything, play the best games, they usually have a plethora of ports and connectors around them, they have high definition video, they have high definition sound. They're actually not that heavy uh, and this, when you put on a docking station connected to an external keyboard, a mouse and a monitor, you wouldn't know the difference between that and a traditional box. Definitely. One of the things that actually you can tell straight away just by looking at an Ultrabook as compared to a laptop is that Ultrabook will not have a dedicated number keypad, right? whereas a laptop will have a full-size keyboard with full capabilities and it will also have like a number keypad that you can use. Slates obviously don't have that either. You have to pull them all up every time you want to use it. So it is a bit of a learning curve just to get your head around having not having a keyboard and not having it there at your convenience. Just a couple of things, but you'll get used to that straight away. Like I said, it comes down to your individual preference as to what you want to use your computer for. So what are we? let's look at some comparisons between them. For example, battery life for a portable device, that's extremely important. It is indeed. Now, this one... One of the things that they've done in order to keep it so thin is it's, this one's got a solid state hard drive. Now what that means is in a normal hard drive you've basically got platted disks which have little needles that read and because there's a moving part it necessarily means that it becomes a bottleneck in terms of speed. Because this one's got an SSD which is a solid state drive it means that there's no moving parts and it means that it's very very quick and it also sucks less power which means that this particular Ultrabook has got a 9 hour battery life which is Phenomenal. And like I said, I might even take this one home with me. We never know. So that's making it possibly suitable for travel. 
Definitely. This is exactly what you want as your travel companion. And it's because of the fact that you can open and close the lid, you don't have to worry about perhaps cracking the screen as you would with a tablet or a slate. To be honest, I think that is one thing with slates. Uh, they would seem like a great thing to travel with, but I'm not convinced that they're not still fragile. That's very true, and I agree with you. I know that you can get all kinds of cases and stuff that you can put the, the tablet into, and that's basically designed to protect the screen. But, you know, like I said accidents happen, mishaps happen. If you're taking it with you on a travel, then you've got to really take care of it and be sure that you understand that it is fragile and because it's got a touch screen, you don't want to cause any damage to it. Having said that, in business meetings or any kind of collaborative effort, these are extremely handy. Oh, yeah. I mean, gone are the days where you have to print off an agenda for everybody or print off the latest version of a document. You can simply share that up and everybody can look at it on their screen. That's exactly right. Now, all of them come with your basic stuff like wireless connectivity and they come with each of them. It's got a little camera on there so you can use them for Skype and you can use them for video conferencing, which is great. And of course, the laptop's got all of that and more. Now, the laptop over there has got a dedicated graphics card and it's got two gigs of memory. Now, what this all means is it means you can do stuff like video editing. It means you can obviously watch Blu-rays and high definition films. And it also means that you can really not have to utilize all the resources of the computer itself in terms of its CPU and its hard drive to make, you know, to do your, I guess, let's say what? Any kind of software. Anything high end if you do video encoding. If Anything you did any like that. work with uh, uh, geographical systems or maps. Yep. If you did anything, any kind of high-end gaming. Yep. Uh, so basically what we're saying is that this one is going to be a complete replacement for your standard desktop if you choose that you want to go that way. And that's exactly what they aim for with that segment of the market. These are meant to be more like your, you know, your on-the-go kind of machine that you can take with you. is completely portable and for that reason, you know, it's got a lot of convenience that's already built in. Mm. Should we do a quick rundown of the specification? Sure. Okay. So what are we looking at for memory? Well, for the now? Ultrabook, this one, it's got four gigs of memory. Now, what that means is it allows you to do basically some gaming, it allows you to do some video editing, it allows you to do some basic stuff, not really high-end stuff, but some basic stuff that you would normally get in your desktop or high-end laptop. And that's really good. It's got a dedicated graphics card. It's got standard wireless. It's got running Windows 7 Professional as well, so it's um, a little bit higher than your entry-level Ultrabook, and that's mm. really good. What as about far that? as the slate goes, I mean, really, these are becoming small computers. Uh, we've got about half the memory. We've got two gigabytes, yep. which is still considerable. We're running Windows Home, slightly yep. less features, but for a slate, uh, that's, that's, that's not bad. We've got a 1.6 gigahertz Atom processor, specifically designed to be small and use a little bit of power. Um, really, everything else is quite similar. What have we got in hard drive? We've got 70 gigabytes which is considerable for, for something a so device small. this big. Anything beyond that, you can use web services like Dropbox. That's right, and you can also Dropbox. use, you can have expandable memory in this one and this one. You can put in SD cards, which increase your memory and increase your hard drive space, which is perfect. Now, for that thing over this there, one. that thing is chock-a-block. It's got a Core i7 CPU, which is the highest level CPU. It means it can run anything and it can run multiple things and it can run it continuously. It's also got a 500 gig hard drive, which means it's got room to store so much, so much. Like for example, this thing can apparently store 52 hours of HD video and that's 128. So times that by five. And that's basically what you've got in that thing there. It's got a dedicated graphics card with two gigs of memory, which means it'll allow you to play the most complicated games if you're into games it'll allow you to go on to the most complicated photoshop if you wanted to edit stuff all together in your photos or if you wanted to do some real photo editing then that's the machine for you like i said it all comes down to basically what it is that you intend to use your computer for as to which one you would choose even though convenience is a massive factor in today's world so as a quick summary the slate extremely portable limited features will take some getting used to particularly for touch typists yeah, but that might be something you're interested in. The Ultrabook has got more of your traditional sort of feel to it, and it's got, as, as part of that, it's got more of your traditional sort of specs, so you can do things that you would normally be able to do without really being hindered. Travel and, students. Exactly, travel students. If you're going to go anywhere, and let's face it, if you want to spend up the kids' inheritance, then this is probably the one you want to look at. And then that thing over there, which um, I'm pretty sure we're not going to let get back to the store without one of us taking it. Um, 
That's got everything you could ever possibly want to use and is a standard desktop replacement if you want it to be that. Yeah, this is anything and everything with the ports and connectors on it. Yeah, oh, and with all the different ports, you've got HDMI, you've got VGA, you can connect it up. So it's got USB 3 in there too, which means it's much, much faster. Basically, all the bells and whistles that you could ever need is right there for you and in a small form factor and it's still very light. I think we're really spoiled for choice nowadays when it comes to ultra-portable computing. Yeah, and that's pretty uh, pretty much our summary for portable computers yeah. at the moment. So special thanks to Lead Assistance for allowing us to play with their toys. and um, Let we'll, us know if you want to know anything more. Yeah, please send us any information, any questions, anything you'd like to know about either one or all of them, and we'll endeavour to answer that for you. In this segment of PCTV, we're going to show you how to set up your own YouTube channel so that you can upload all the photos or videos into one location where your friends and family can access it. Now to set it up, it's not that difficult at all. We'll take you through right now. First of all, you need to go to youtube.com. Go to the section where it says create account. Cool. And it's going, and it's going. Now in this instance, we're gonna actually create a, an account for Kay, so that he can have his own YouTube channel, something he's always wanted. It takes you to a normal sign up page where you can see stuff like your name, password and other bits and pieces, which we'll go through in a second. So first of all, create a username. Choose a username. Uh, first thing in the screen, first name and last. Setting up a, it's a Gmail. It's essentially a Gmail. Yeah, because it's a Google username. And this will be signed into all of your Google accounts, YouTube, Chrome, and Gmail. Create your password. And then re-enter that password. Damn it. Good, he did. Put in his birthday and his gender. K is ready to go, almost. Like that if you want. If you don't want Google as your homepage, just deselect it. They try to get that in there for you. Then you have to type in the human verification. That's to prove that you're not a robot, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, they could write programs that would go around creating automatic accounts and spamming people with them, and doing all sorts of mischief. Computers have a very difficult time reading that kind of text. That's right. You agree to the Google Terms of Service and their privacy policy. It won't let you create the account unless you do that. So it's something that you have to do. You can go through and read the privacy policy and the Terms of Service if you like. It's pretty long and involved. However, it is worth having a look. Definitely. Everyone always skims over that, or your EULA, your end user license agreement, yet there are things worth knowing. Next. Okay, now we get up to creating your profile. An email from Google. Yep. Uh, we'll send to the email address that you've specified in that first part. Yep. And by clicking on that, it's a unique link. Uh, that will verify that that email address is real and attached to your account and then you'll be able to use And when YouTube. you're creating a profile, they'll ask if you want to put in your picture or whatever else you want. You can add your own profile photo. Of course, you don't have to. It just gives you a default silhouette otherwise. You go next. Set. Apparently, we're all set. And then... You've got your own, he's got his own account, K, as you can see, and he's ready to go. Now he can start to upload whatever videos, pictures, or anything else he wants to put into his YouTube account. Mm. There's various options for customizing the way that the YouTube channel appears, and giving it themes, and various things. It's up to the user. Back to YouTube. And that's how you make your own YouTube channel. It's as simple as that. And of course, all of this will be available for you on our YouTube channel where you can go back and check and reassess or make sure you've done everything correctly. It'll all be, all the information will be there. This segment of PCTV is all about fun stuff. And as the name implies, it's just about having fun with your computer on the internet. So. We're going to take you to a few websites that we like to go to that we figure are really good fun for you to have a look at every day if you like or any time you feel like it. 
First one we're going to do is called the Bureau of Meteorology's website where you can see the radar map that you might see on news presenters on the weather showing you the rain. So if you're planning on maybe going out to play some golf or something during the day, you can check this website just before you go and you get an indication of how much rain is actually on its way. Very useful site. It is indeed. So should we punch this one up here? Punch it up. Okay. So we'll just do a quick Google search for the Bureau of Meteorology. Comes up straight away. Straight away. Do we want the radar? Radar. Radar. And then we can pick where we want to go. So we'll be looking at Adelaide. And there you and go. There we go. Now, as you can see, it's a very, very rainy afternoon as we're filming today here in the studio. But this will give you an indication of exactly how much rainfall is coming in at the moment. And okay. you'll find it very useful, especially if you'd like to do some outdoor activities and don't want to have that spoiled. Yeah, planning a trip or cancelling a wedding, this is going to help you do it. <laughs> and the cool thing about it is it gives you different views. So you can go 64 kilometres out, which is the view they use mainly on, um, on your news weather presenter programs. And then you can go further out to 128 or 256 or even get a national view, which gives you a quick map of all of Australia. There you go. Not too bad at all. Not too bad. And that's updated live. So it's a current image that's happening right now. So it's in real time and that's very useful. Hmm. Well, so that's the, uh, that's the bomb side. The what bomb. else do we have? <laughs> well, we've got, um, oh, if you miss out on anything in the city and you want to know what's going on in Adelaide, you can always go to Adelaide Now's website, which will give you a current up to date uh, rundown on everything that's happening in the city of Adelaide, including news, views, um, anything else that basically is happening in the city. Okay, we'll do a quick search here for Adelaide Now. Pops up straight away. Straight away. There we go. go, Adelaide Now. Adelaide Now. It's basically a port of a lot of the information that comes from uh, the advertiser, Sunday Mail and the Messenger. Exactly, mm. exactly. So lots of current events, lots of stuff about you know um, entertainment events that's happening at the time. You can even go and see your horoscopes, you've got more news tells you the temperature of the Adelaide for the day. It's a really useful site just for local content. Okay. What else do we have? What about iView? iView is one of my favorite sites. I actually think uh, the design and the implementation of this website is exceptional. Uh, it's an ABC site. It is indeed. Click on it. And it allows us to view uh, shows and periodicals that were put on ABC that you may have missed. Uh, it's very aware of your internet connection. That's very true. Now remember, because this is download streaming and if you want to watch a film or something, you'll have to make sure that your internet connection is fast enough to allow you to do that. And also you may want to check and see whether or not you've got enough data in your contract or whatever you've got set up in order to allow that to happen and not get you into trouble and maybe push you over the limit and make you pay some fines. Yes, that's right. Even regarding uh, the speed of your internet, the iView site will give you some advice or a warning if your connection is not fast enough to support the... I like that intuitiveness of iView. Yeah. So iView is fantastic. Yeah, because you can catch up on ones. any program that ABC, ABC1, ABC2, ABC3 is sh broadcasting at the time. And they also got some stuff that goes back over a little bit too, in case you missed some stuff, which is really good. And I often find myself coming to this site specifically to catch up on some of my favorite programs. Hmm. Well, that's iView. What else do we have to look at? Oh, there's a uh, famous Wikipedia. Ah. You haven't connected to the internet if you haven't seen Wikipedia. Wikipedia, type it in. So. Wikipedia is like an, um, an online encyclopedic source for you to get basically any kind of information on any topic you care to name, and it'll be there. Wikipedia is the largest source of information on the internet for public consumption today. Definitely. Unfortunately, it's a little sad, but it has, uh, I heard recently, Encyclopedia Britannica, after 150 years or something, have finally ceased printing hard copy because Wikipedia is it's just a sad simply, day. Yeah, it, is it is a, a sad, sad day. day. But it's a good day for people looking things up. Sure. <laughs> I mean, you never had the convenience before of just being able to type in anything and any, any point of interest that you feel that you want to look up, it's right there in Wikipedia. My only caveat to Wikipedia is that you can actually edit the entries if you can. If you want, they've got the facilities there for you to actually edit the entries, which could raise some questions about the source materials, but at the same time, there's so many people accessing it at all times that they usually tend to correct anyone that tries to put anything too outlandish or Well, that's false. right. It, it, 
it's done that in, to, in order to try and capture everyone's perspectives and points exactly. of view. Exactly. And there are people who devote their time as moderators yep. to fact checking and just making sure that things aren't biased or you know, particularly hateful or anything or like that. Depending on your political skew as well, I yes, think true. you'll find that you'll, you'll see a lot of political things that are pulled out or pulled away or not allowed. So if something is up on Wikipedia and contested by someone, it will tell you that read this with a grain of salt because it is contested by other people. So it's a collaborative effort. And I like that. And Me like too. I said, in terms of convenience, there is nothing like Wikipedia. Mm. It's fantastic. Yeah. What else? I think uh, we've got the IMDB. Okay, Pretty sure. handy for people. Do you want to explain what that is? The IMDB is the Internet Movie Database. Yep. And uh, this is a place where you can find out about all movies, TV shows as well, upcoming movies, reviews, uh, cast lists, everything you wanted to, kn to know. So it's basically your Wikipedia of movies. Wow. Mm -hmm. It's a great site. Yes, Can you actually is. watch films or TV stuff in that, on there? No, you might see your official trailers and so forth. Right. But again, you know, uh, intellectual property rights and so forth prevent them from showing. Definitely. And copyright laws are going crazy every single day on the internet. So no one really knows exactly what is and isn't allowed. A lot of sites are very, very cautious nowadays. I think you're fine. In addition to getting the stats and the basic facts about movies, you can also go to RottenTomatoes.com, which uh, gives you your subjective reviews. And uh, it's a funny little site. It uh, will show a little happy tomato if uh, the review is good and a splat if it's So is the review good. done by just the general public or is it like proper critics of movies that are doing these reviews? Well, it's a mix of both. Right. Um, it'll, it'll break them up. It'll give you an overall average um, of a percentage of whether it's a good film or not. Yep. And it gathers a significant amount of critical reviewers from all around the world. And, of course, there's the user community and thousands of people add their two cents worth. Of course, everyone's going to have their two cents worth. Yeah, but I think it's a, it's a fun site to have a look at. Definitely. Well, as a contrast, IMDB, I think it's a good site to have a look at. Mm. Definitely. Well, I suppose those are the fun things we'll look at this time. Yeah, and every week we'll be making sure that we look at different fun things that you can look at and websites you can go to on the internet. And, of course, if you want to add a few, then please get in touch with us at our YouTube channel, which the information for which you'll be seeing probably at the bottom of my screen right now. Yeah, because certainly whatever we've missed, let us know. Yeah.